Shannon, thank you so much for being with us today and our project Speaking Truth to Youth. And I just have a couple of questions I want to ask you and that we can talk about. The first one is, what in your youth led you to a position where you felt you could be an activist? I never imagined myself as an activist. Um, I did grow up in Rochester, New York, where we were taught early on to admire and respect activists who either lived in or passed through that area. It was really a hotbed of civil rights and uh, suffrage activism. Everyone from Susan B. Anthony to Harriet Tubman um, made their mark on Rochester. And that's where we would go on field trips when I was little. So I think that cultivated um, that admiration, particularly for women activists in me. But I didn't ever really get involved in politics or any kind of activism um, until the shooting at Sandy Hook School. I was in corporate communications. I was raising my family. Uh, I was pretty busy. But it just so happened that when Sandy Hook happened, I had been on a five-year break from my career because I had remarried and uh, my husband and I were blending our family of five. And I just thought, you know, this is a good time to pause. I've got a lot of kids in elementary all the way through college. Um, and, and I'm just going to take a break and focus on that. And I was actually just getting ready to go back to work when the mass shooting tragedy happened. It really was this interesting situation where all of my skills that I had learned, whether it was admiring activists or being in communications, they came together. It was sort of like the perfect storm. I think I was an accidental activist, but I was also kind of preparing for that all the, the all along my journey of life. I had always been alarmed and shocked by gun violence in this country. I can remember I lived in Texas when um, there was one of the first mass shootings after CNN was created. So it was something you could almost watch in real time unfold for hours and hours. It was it was a shooting inside a restaurant called Luby's, which was a, a restaurant that is particular to the South. And I was just right in front of my television, not able to move, just disbelieving the tragedy that I was seeing in our country and almost feeling even back then, like, how is this happening in America? I really kind of felt that way with every horrific mass shooting tragedy. There were much less of them back then. But, you know, when Columbine happened, I was a young mom and I was stunned, but I was so busy. I couldn't become an activist. I kind of thought, oh, lawmakers will take care of this. And then again and again, you know, everything from Virginia Tech. And I think what really for me was astounding was that after the mass shooting in Tucson, Arizona, at the event for uh, Representative Gabby Giffords, that her colleagues did nothing in the wake of that shooting, right? One of their own had been a victim and they were not moved to act. So I, I think when Sandy Hook happened, I knew nothing would happen. I knew that lawmakers weren't going to do anything and it was going to be up to citizens to do something. Again, I'm not sure what made me think that I could do something, but I felt like I had to get off the sidelines. You know, I, I was a white suburban privileged mom who was scared her kids weren't safe in their schools. And it really wasn't until I got involved in gun violence that I realized school shootings were such a small portion of the gun violence, but that was enough to get me to act. What continues to motivate you or give you some hope or guide you or give you courage as we go forward? I think people who aren't involved in this issue sometimes see it as hopeless. There's like a cynicism around gun violence as though it just is something we need to accept and make the fabric of our lives. And that is not the case. If you are involved in this work, you've seen that there has been a seismic shift on this issue. You know, we have passed over 500 gun safety laws in the last decade. We have stopped the NRA's agenda 90% of the time in the last decade. We passed the first federal gun safety legislation that was signed into law by President Biden in 26 years, a whole generation. Back when I started doing this work in 2012, about a quarter of all Democrats in Congress had an A rating from the NRA a quarter of Democrats. Today, not one does. And, you know, when I, I started doing this in honor of the Sandy Hook School shooting, Joe Manchin and uh, Pat Toomey, a, a Democrat and a Republican senator, 
put together legislation called the Mansion Toomey Bill that would have closed the background check loophole. I was sitting in the Senate gallery when it happened that that legislation failed by a handful of votes, many of them by Democrats that voted against that bill. And the reason they gave was that they were hearing more from their constituents to oppose it than to support it. When that federal legislation called the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act passed in 2022, we had 15 Republicans vote for it. And the reason they voted for it, they said, was because they were hearing more from their constituents to support it than to oppose it. Activism is working. I think it's interesting that when you look at polling of, of women in particular, regardless of political party, women support the same measures to reduce gun violence in this country. So really what's standing in the way are extremist lawmakers who are still doing the bidding of the gun lobby. And I just think it's a matter of time. My kids say to me, like, I can't believe you laid out in the sun and you tried to get a tan and you used tinfoil and baby oil. I think we're going to look at gun violence the same way, like we do at smoking or, or other dangerous behaviors. Like, how did you allow this to happen? What, why did this chaos reign in America? But it will take everybody getting off the sidelines to make that happen. That has been my goal is to just get everyone to feel like they're invested in this issue. Well, I think there's two groups of people when you're talking about changing hearts and minds. There's one group of extremists who are not gonna move their position on this at all. The guns has become their organizing principle. It gets new recruits in the door, it raises money, and it gets the base excited about a whole host of issues that have nothing to do with guns. And I don't waste my time trying to talk to gun extremists because it's a small percentage of Americans. If we get the majority on the right side of this issue, that's how we get change. It's not by changing the hearts and minds of extremists. But I do think there is this subgroup, and I would consider my own family to be part of that, which you know, they're conservative, they're Republican, but they also see gun violence as being out of control, or they uh, see it as maybe even part of their religious platform, like this pro-life idea. That's not something I subscribe to necessarily, but you know, my father, who is very pro-life, um, anti-abortion, now has adopted gun violence as part of his own platform, which is like, okay, well, as long as you're on the right side of this issue, that's great just be part of the zeitgeist in this country. And, and I think people are realizing they don't have to live this way. I mean, when you look at the data, it shows us that blue states with stronger gun laws have less gun violence and less gun death, and red states with weaker gun laws have more gun violence and more gun death. Now, you can argue that that is part of the Constitution or that is somehow freedom, but that's not how most people want to live. And so I think when you're having these conversations, you actually find you have more in common then you, um, then you don't. What advice do you have for young people, for youth activists? Well, we have Students Demand Action, which was created after the Parkland shooting tragedy because so many younger people were finally coming of age who were part of the, what we call the lockdown generation, right? When I was in school in the 80s, we hid under our desks to hide from nuclear fallout as if that desk was going to protect us. <laughs> And, you know, my generation of kids are hiding in the bathrooms of their classrooms as if that door is going to protect them from the spray of an AR-15. It's equally as absurd. You know, whether it's younger millennials or Gen Z, and now we have Gen Alpha coming up, I think they're outraged that lawmakers, adults who were supposed to protect them, actually protected the profits of the gun industry. There's going to be a big reckoning there. I think, as more and more of the younger generation is elected. I'm not saying there aren't gun extremists um, that are being inculcated by, you know, the rhetoric and the misinformation of the gun lobby. But I do think that when you're growing up with this as a constant threat in your schools, that that really will change the way you think about this issue. We are already seeing some Gen Z uh, age people being elected to Congress. I mean, that's that's huge because they're advocating for gun safety. I also think that it's important to have people of all generations advocate. You know, I, I get asked about young people a lot. I will tell you our most effective activists are actually retired grandparents who have time on their hands to be activists. But I also think there's something to be said for the way younger people are activists. It's always going to be more aggressive. It's always going to be different. It's always going to be cutting edge and it's going to use tools that people in my generation and older don't aren't really that familiar with. Sometimes I feel like we pin all of our hopes on young people and that's too much pressure. We can't expect young people to change everything. It's almost like that gives older people an excuse to throw up their hands and say like, we tried our best, we're done. I think you have to be an activist until you are no longer alive, right? Like 
Alice Walker says activism is the rent I pay to live on the planet. And I think that applies to every age group. Well, you can text the word students to 64433 and someone will call you back pretty immediately and help you figure out how to either start a chapter of Students Demand Action where you live or to join one, high school age students and up right now. But not only will we show you how to get involved, we will help you learn how to be an activist. And the way we advocate is culturally, legislatively, and electorally. Obviously, we have a big election cycle coming up. And so we need people getting out the vote and telling people, you know, who to vote for and when they can vote and how to vote. Um, if you're working on this culturally, you might be educating people about secure gun storage or showing up at your school and uh, advocating to keep guns out of your school or off campus. And if you're working on this legislatively, you know, we're in the swing of, of legislative session right now, maybe you're showing up at your state house or meeting with your lawmakers. So, and I think the great thing about our organization is we don't just plug you in, but we give you the skills, we train you. Um, and every year we have something called Gun Sense University, which Students Demand Action leaders come to. Um, we bring together thousands of Moms Demand Action and Students Demand Action volunteers from across the country. And it's really like three or four days of training and, and getting to know your peers and creating a community and celebrating your wins. Joy is so much a part of activism and community is so much a part of activism. And I think that's a real benefit if you're young to, to meet other people. Thank you so and much. I you. appreciate it.